Good morning, good day, good evening. Hello, welcome everyone to our next keynote session for this, the Aussie Live conference this year. Today, or well, this morning, uh, our time we have Julie Lindsay with her session entitled The Dragon That Roars, The Imperative of Online Global Collaborative Learning. Julie is an expert in global collaboration and she works intensely with teachers and schools to develop skills in their teachers and students to, to co uh, collaborate globally. Um, so I would love to thank our supporters and sponsors. Uh, a big thank you to Adult Learning Australia and Broadband for Seniors, a recent addition to our supporters. Um, the Australia E-Series brings you this conference, so uh, we're all a little team who work very hard to bring this to you, so thank you everyone for being there to, to make this happen, especially Coach Carol. Uh, and the Learning Revolution and Steve Hargenden, uh, thank you very much for your support, we really appreciate that, and Blackboard Collaborate for our room. So to get started today, I'd like you, if you're able to, um, to pick up a little icon, either a globe or a smiley face, and just add to the map where you are. I'm currently in South West-ish Queensland, I'm just getting ready to head off to work, and I know we've got a few people all over the world, including Peggy George in Arizona, so thank you for very, very much, Peggy, for coming and being here today. Okay, so I'll hand over to Julie. Thank you, Julie. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this session, and I will chat with you soon. Thanks, Ness. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm currently not on the east coast of Australia where I normally reside, uh, just above Byron Bay there, northern New South Wales. I'm actually in Adelaide doing some work. So thank you so much. I know it's a difficult time of the day for Australian and New Zealand teachers and schools, but you know we will have the recording and it's just a great opportunity uh, and I'm very delighted that you invited me to talk today. So thanks so much. Let's go. Uh, so this is the dragon that roars. Isn't this a great dragon? Uh, I found this, of course, in uh, you know, Creative Commons images. And it reminds me of when I did live in China. I lived in Beijing for three years, from 2009 until 2012. And the Chinese are very fond of cutting out, doing paper cutouts. And red, of course, was the colour that they used often to cut these, these images out. And it just, uh, I love this picture. So the idea of a dragon, you know, in Chinese law, the dragon was a benevolent creature uh, with powers to bring rain, floods, and even hurricanes. And along with this ability, the dragon signified power, strength, and good luck. So also in conjunction with the fact that I want to talk about a particular global experience that I'm uh, co-running at the moment called Connect with China, I thought the dragon was quite uh, significant because I do want to talk about the imperative of online global collaborative learning and how we need a bit of power and strength to move this along. All right, let's go here. Um, oh, this is more about me, of course. Uh, I think you probably, uh, thank you to Ness, of course, for her introduction. Uh, lots of things that I'm doing there. Please have a look at uh, about.me, Julie Lindsay, and uh, Flat Connections, etc. I've got some other things coming up there, some more links. These slides will be available online. I'm actually currently trying to upload them. My upload bandwidth is not good where I am at the moment, but <laughs> they'll get there. <laughs> All right, so stories of global connection. Now, this is just you know, one of those typical screenshots that uh, my friend Anne Murchison then tweeted out. We were all sitting in a meeting last week, uh, kicking off our Connect with China collaborative. Uh, in that image there, we've got teachers from Canada, USA, Australia. Uh, nobody from China in particular in that image. But uh, you know, this is typical of many, many stories of how people come together across the world to learn from each other, to start, propel, conclude, celebrate, etc. global collaborations. Just this week, uh, when was it? Yesterday, in fact, uh, we kicked off uh, my upper primary school project called A Week in the Life. And I had uh, Canada, USA, Costa Rica, Thailand, uh, Australia in the same meeting room. We also have Nepal in the project. They couldn't make the kickoff meeting. But you know, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how uh, wonderful it is to actually organise to get people from different parts of the world into a synchronous meeting. 
uh, not that it's all about syn synchronicity, uh, but to be able to get people together and to see their faces, hear their voices, and that's just an amazing uh, connection for global learning, the future of global learning. Right, so I want to talk about uh, a few different things, and I'm, I'm phrasing this as questions today, actually. So, you know, the, the inquiring mind, you know, people coming along, perhaps some of you listening to this, uh, welcome to, to Corinne, who's just joined us, and Joe Frey, thank you for being here. Uh, you, you may not know a lot about online global collaboration. You may be uh, wanting to jump in, or maybe you're quite experienced and you're just here to, to uh, interact, etc. But you know, what is online global collaboration? Well, we're, we're talking about geographically dispersed classrooms learners. Though, of course, geographically dispersed could mean from one side of the USA to the other, or one side of Australia to the other, of course. Similar types of time zone differences there. Uh, we are talking about the use of online technologies. And this is why I use the word online more often these days, because we know that global collaboration has been going on for a long time. Uh, with snail mail, you know, you put something in a letter or you put a parcel together, you mail it to someone in someone else in the world, someone else in the world, and they receive it, respond, etc. And that's great, that is still going on, wonderful learning opportunities. But with the advent of the internet in the last 20 plus years, we are now talking more about online, these online global experiences that do rely on technologies. And to me, you know, it's not just learning with. Sorry, sorry, it's learning. With, <laughs> right? It's learning with, not just about. Okay, so we're not just um, opening up a package and saying, "Oh, this is their national animal. This is their postcard of their famous bridge, etc." It's actually coming together, bringing learners together, teachers and students to learn with each other. And as they're learning with each other, it's to co-create these new understandings and share the many sort of, you know, things that they create, share these online for other learners to uh, benefit from. So what are the features of successful online global collaboration? Well, you know, without reading all of these out necessarily, uh, let's see, let's pick some strong project organisation. I mean, it really does take successful online global collaboration takes uh, quite a bit of organisation, as I said, to get five different countries into a room uh, at the same time into a synchronous room does take organisation, it takes tools to organise scheduling, it takes communication to organise, you know, this is where we are, this is the link, can you get yourself in, this is the time you're supposed to be there, etc. Um, it does take Uh, oh no, it looks like Julie has um, lost some connection there. Um, hopefully she'll pop back in in a minute. I'm sure, I oh, hear she is great, Julie, sorry. It looks like you've got a few connection issues there. I kicked out, no, but I'm back. I think you can hear me, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. All right, so reliable, frequent communication, et cetera, et cetera uh, relevant to the curriculum. Uh, so these are, you know, if you're looking at, well, what is this about? These are the, uh, the successes, the bridges to success. Thanks, Ness. Bye for now. Right, so why is online global collaboration imperative? These are the reasons. If you, if you need to go into your administration or if you need to pitch this to some of your colleagues at school because you're a, a grade three teacher who really wants to do this and your colleagues don't want to do this, this is what your pitch should look like. Right? We want to build global competency and intercultural understanding. understanding. We want to focus um, on um, online technologies. We've got these iPads. We have these Chromebooks. We have technology. What are we doing with them? Word processing and... Uh, uh, other simple things just doesn't cut it anymore. You've got to be connecting with the world. This is what technology is for, as well as other things, of course, you know, coding and other great things that are happening in education. Uh, it is a new paradigm for modern learning. It really is. And of course, globalisation. We need to think global and act global, and we can't do that unless we're connecting globally. Yeah, elevator pitch, absolutely. Thanks, Peggy. All right, so what are enablers or barriers to collaborating globally? Now, there's a, there's a few on this list. 
and you're thinking, uh, oh yes, yes, that's no, I'm fine with that one. No, that one's a problem. So as you look at this list, you know, think about well, what what are the ones that are really challenging me? Maybe you haven't found reliable partners yet. Um, maybe you are not comfortable with Web 2.0's tools. Uh, maybe your technology infrastructure is still challenged. Uh, you need some upgrades. Uh, maybe your technology access is being blocked. Maybe you need to talk to your IT people and talk to your administration. That elevator pitch once again. Um, and uh, try and sort that out. Maybe uh, the curriculum conformity there is, is one, I talk about that in terms of uh, you're someone perhaps you know, in an English teaching faculty and you really want to do something but your school says no unless all of the English teachers do it, you can't do it. So that's, that's often a, a barrier. Sometimes a barrier is teacher attitudes towards digital technologies, not, not having that sort of constructivist approach, not feeling digitally fluent enough, worried that they don't know enough to actually bring this to the students. Uh, and you know, sometimes that just needs a bit of talking through, some mentors to support you, uh, thinking, I mean, I, I think most global teachers will tell you, and I've talked to a lot of global teachers in the last two years with the book that I've written and the doctorate research that I'm doing, most teachers will tell you that they feel as though they know less than the students about the technology, but that has not stopped them. That does not stop them from bringing uh, these opportunities to the classroom because it's really the teacher that is the facilitator of these at, at this point. Uh, Coach Carol says, barriers include unawareness of potentials and benefits. Absolutely, Carol. Yes, thank you for that. Yes, not being fully aware, not having felt or experienced that, and I, I still use the word power, that power of global connectedness. Once you experience that, uh, you know, we say, once you go flat, you never go back. <laughs> it's still a bit of a catch cry. Um, and when you're in the know, you, you understand what that means. Once you go flat, you never go back. <laughs> All right, so just a quick mention about, and I use words like teacherpreneur, learning concierge, but I've got the word outlier featured in this presentation. Absolutely, yeah, once you go flat. Um, so an outlier, and this is from the work, I'm taking this definition from the work of a colleague over there in Canada, Soraya Artiega, who did her doctorate. Um, dissertation um, three years ago, I think she finished. So she says, an outlier teacher is a K-12 educator who's self-directed to create and develop an innovative pedagogy using emerged or emerging digital social media through collaborative and global open networking. Now this is after she interviewed a number of teachers, uh, these, it's a case study dissertation, etc. So this is someone, so maybe you are an outlier. Maybe you have an outlier in your school and you're looking at them thinking, oh, that's what you are. You're forging ahead. You're developing these innovative pedagogies. You're using the technologies. You're opening your class to the world. Uh, and I think probably people in this room are outliers as well. I'm pretty sure you are. So think about that word. Talk about that word with your colleagues. Now, the question is, do teachers know how to redesign curriculum? And I'm thinking, in my experience, no, they don't really know at this point how to redesign curriculum for online global collaboration. And that's a large part of the work that I do with teachers in schools at the moment. So to, in order to make the shift, we need to consider these questions. So who can you collaborate with? So what are those connections that you can make and collaboration? So we need to be able to design, design our learning so that we do connect. What can you create together and where will this creative legacy be shared? So we need to be able to construct uh, the learning and then share, share the legacy. And what are the actionable outcomes to change the world? So in other words, uh, what, what is it that's come out of this collaboration that we can share? How can we amplify this? And what is the impact going to be on our immediate world and perhaps the world beyond? beyond us, uh, internationally, globally, etc. Et so just consider uh, what does curriculum redesign look like? 
I know we, as teachers, we go through redesign a lot of the time. You know, in 30 years of being in the classroom, um, I taught across three different systems, the British system, the um, Australian, Victor well, Victoria, I was in Victoria's uh, education system, and um, the International Baccalaureate. I worked in IB schools for 10 years. So lots of redesign from my point of view, lots of rethinking, refocusing. Uh, so we, we are used to, not that we don't do it, but do teachers know how to do it so that they can embed online global collaborative experiences into their into their classroom? That's the question. And what structures are there to support this? How, where do we start? You know, what, what's the starting point? How important is design and management? And I know it's very easy now, and it's great to be able to hop in, do a mystery Skype, connect, bring the, you know, bring different people into the classroom, etc. Uh, that doesn't necessarily take a lot of design. Uh, it does take a little bit of digital fluency to be able to do that. Uh, but we need to go beyond that. You know, that they're, they're great tasters, having a mystery Skype, having a, um, you know, people into the classroom like that, but, uh, synchronously or asynchronously. But the design comes in so that we can support going beyond that. And then, of course, when you do design something that goes, say, for six weeks or longer, uh, we need to look at well, what's the, what are the management criteria here? How are we going to manage this so that the students are learning and the teachers are successfully getting through the uh, collaboration? All right, so one of the things that I talk about, of course, is the design thinking cycle. Using this design thinking cycle to shape your online global collaboration and starting with empathy, uh, you know, working out, well, how are we going to learn about the audience? What are the activities we're going to do, uh, such as a digital handshake? We do digital handshakes in Flat Connections projects, uh, but just uh, mystery Skypes as well, or Skype calls, real-time calls, so that we get to know our, our collaborators. And then, of course, you know, defining defining what it is we're going to be collaborating on. Is it on global issues? Is it about culture and society? Is it about emerging technologies? What is it we're going to come together and talk about? Uh, and then, of course, ideating, coming up with uh, uh, research, researched um, input and then solutions for the questions that we've asked, the inquiry questions. And then uh, prototype, building something, building a representation of a solution or building something together, co-creating something together. And then, of course, the feedback. And feedback is evident in every part of this process, but particularly towards the end, the feedback is really um, reflection and celebration, having that opportunity to, to share the learning and then uh, invite ref uh, reflection and celebration. So that's one structure that teachers can use. I also use um, the norms of online global collaboration, and this is something that um, I've put together recently that I'd like to just briefly talk about. So there are eight norms here, and the first one is to be prepared. So in other words, uh, we need to be able to connect uh, and we need to be able to communicate. So, you know, is it clear who this project is for? Is it clear how participants will join? Is it clear how participants will connect? What common tools will be used? What time zones will participants be working in? So that everyone has that sort of connected sort of understanding. And then to communicate, uh, is it clear how teachers will communicate during the project and with the project organisers? Uh, what, is, what are the opportunities for synchronous uh, connections? Uh, what are the communication protocols during the project? Uh, what are we expecting from our students? I've, I've just put two projects into Edmodo groups in the last week uh, with the discussion, discussing with the teachers that this is a professional learning environment. It's not a place for students to use text, speak or colloquialisms. Uh, try to avoid colloquialisms when you've got six different countries and cultures in a project. Uh, it, it doesn't support understanding and communication if you're using words common only to you and your class or your, your city, etc. Uh, what are the communication expectations during the project? Um, all right, let's move to norm two. So norm two is, uh, once you've sorted out connection and communication, is to have a purpose. Is the purpose of the project clear? Is the length of the, of the collaboration clear? 
is the set length or flexible? As long as people start with that the similar understanding of where it's going, you know, what is this going to take ten weeks? Is it going to take three weeks? Uh, and then people can make a decision if they're ready to join, if they're able to join, if it fits in with their with their plans for their class. Uh, what are the shared inputs from participants? What are the shared outcomes? Will there be artifact exchange? Will there be co-creation of outcomes? So that's uh, you know the purpose of the collaboration. Norm three, uh, be able to paraphrase. So this one, by this I mean, does the project material use global language or is it biased towards one culture? And I'm not just talking about differences in spelling because we're all pretty aware that um, you know, there's American English, there's British English, there's even Australian English, I think, at times. Uh, so we, we were able to work with that. But um, you know, communicating for understanding, we do have different terms for things and it's having that inquiry based approach so that if you don't understand you ask well what do you mean by that you know um, and are all aspects of the project clear and culturally neutral and if not is there a reason why so it, there may be a reason maybe it is a, a fairly monocultural type of project and, and that's fine as well as long as everyone's clear uh, sorry Peggy I'm just looking at the uh, Julie, do you put all of this in writing? I'll just use it to guide conversations or play. Um, I've got a lot of things in writing about all of this, Peggy. It's actually all in the book that's coming out as well. All of this uh, will be in the Global Educator book. Uh, so that uh, you can uh, have a look at that when it comes out, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> Thanks. All right, so norm four, uh, be able to perceive, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> being able to know, understand the parameters of the project so that you can join. Uh, is it clear what teachers have to prepare before joining the project? And are you able to share, are you willing and able to share lesson resources and plans and advice with others? So that this is really important as well. Do you perceive that this project is something that you're going to be able to really hop into and embrace and share and flatten your learning with? Is that Otherwise, there may be problems. So you need to understand that. Norm five. Welcome to Angela. who's just joined us. Great, excellent. Peggy says, how do you keep teachers from feeling overwhelmed for the depth comprehensiveness of the project? I think that the key uh, factor here, Peggy, is ongoing communication. Very, very regular communication. One way to do this, uh, one way that I use, is using Google Groups where we're in almost daily uh, communication, connection with teachers, questions, um, updates, uh, this is what you should be doing this week, have you managed to do this, etc. And not just sort of hopping into a global project or a global learning experience and saying, right, this is what we're going to be doing, we'll see you in three weeks' time with your finished product. It doesn't work like that. It's really like it's like having the teacher in the classroom next door, except it's virtual. You say hello every morning. You you say how's it going, and you know if you've got a problem, you say oh, I had a problem with that, and then you you help them fix it up, etc. So it's really you build a learning community of educators around the online global collaboration, uh, and that's a really important thing to remember. And that's where the dragon that rules comes in, because you know that collab, that community is the dragon that rules. That's where the power is. So norm five. Sorry, this is taking a bit of time. I'll try and speed this up <laughs> through these norms, but they're all important. Norm five is uh, participate. So how will learning be visible? How are the students going to participate in this? Um, what will we see? What will teachers and students need to, con to contribute and when? When will they contribute? And are the timeline and the main contribution times clear and detailed? Norm 6 is positive. So this is about encouraging a positive and constructive approach during the project. So are there guidelines for encouraging this? You know, um, are there guidelines for not just contributing but also responding and interacting with others? Is, is that being encouraged? You know, often students who aren't used to this and teachers who are new to global collaboration come into a project and they put their bit in. They say, well, here's our handshake, here's our piece. 
and then they do nothing. They don't respond to anyone else. They don't um, interact, and it's almost like a it's a lost opportunity. Also, here is uh, global digital citizenship objectives and understandings. You know, what what does that mean? And we have lots of discussions about this as well. Being positive about online learning. Uh, and how are participants in the project being monitored for best practices? And the understanding is that everybody monitors everyone's students. Lots of conversations about this. It's not just one teacher with their students like a little bubble in the project. No, in a flat learning environment, it's all teachers, all students, one big classroom. How will empathy be built? Uh, and how will achievements through the project be celebrated, etc. Thanks, Angela. That's great to have you here. Great. Um, norm seven, be productive. How will participants collaborate and share information? What artifacts will be created? Will artifacts be co-created? So will we get students from opposite sides of the world to actually build something together, uh, which is what we do quite often. And most of the time, it's very successful. How will feedback and responses be gathered? our outcomes visible to the world, etc. So this whole productivity piece around the project so that things actually happen. And the final one, uh, norm eight, is realise the potential. Uh, just describe how the uh, project may have some flexibility to ensure the potential of individual learners is realised. So this is really important. So you, know, you might start with this wonderful plan, you want to do this, you want to do that, but you just be aware that you may need to be flexible at times. There may be some uh, learning opportunities. I, I just like the typical story I tell here, I know some people in the room may have heard this already, but many years ago when I was teaching in the Middle East and I ran a virtual session for students in the Middle East with students in the USA, we brought them into Blackboard Collaborate uh, to do a, a session and um, we had an agenda. We wanted the students to talk about this and that. And one of the students said, oh, it was after lunch in my, my area of the world, one of the students said, oh, I just had a mango for lunch. And one of the USA students said, oh, what's a mango? And this started this whole conversation about what they ate for lunch, what fruit they ate, what food there was in each country, etc. So, you know, instead of uh, as teachers saying, hey, you know, be quiet, we've got to get on with our agenda, we just let them go because they were having this one learning experience. So just be aware of that, you know, the serendipity of uh, learning is, is around us all the time and we need to uh, not plan for it, just be ready for it. Okay, so that, that's the eight norms. So um, the other thing I talk about here, of course, is you know, how important is connected and collaborative learning. And this is a diagram that I used to show, you know, flat connected learning is really, it's the, it's the superset. It involves project and challenge based learning, blended learning, flipped learning, uh, inquiry based, etc. And it, it, it depends on the use of Web 2.0, leadership, learning design and pedagogies, new pedagogies there. So I want to share this with you now. I haven't talked about this much yet, but it's about it's coming out in my book, and I want to talk about it more because this is a, a term that I've coined. It's a little bit quaint. Uh, the learning theorists may not be very happy with me. I'm not sure. But I've put a bit of research into this, but I'm using the word cosmogogy. So, and I think this is important to understand that by this I mean. <laughs> I can't <even> pronounce it. <laughs> All right, start practicing, Peggy. <laughs> Cosmogogy. <laughs> it's from the word cosmo. <laughs> Cosmos, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so it's, this is what I mean when I talk about the study of learning while connected to the world using digital technologies whereby the context of learning is with rather than about. All right, so, you know, we've got our um, quartagogy, we've got our andragogy, we've got our peeragogy, right, uh, the peeragogy group, Rheingold, etc., uh, and that's all wonderful, but this is a little different, cosmogogy, connecting to the world, learning with rather than about. It's not location-based based and considers whom you learn with and what you construct together most important. Yes, I'm a great fan of Howard Rheingold of course, with his peeragogy group. 
are. So anyway, think about this uh, because I don't know of another word to describe it and this is the word that I've come up with. So how imperative is online global collabor collaborative learning? And I'm just going to pause here for just a minute or two if there's anything that you would like to add to the chat window uh, or any questions that you'd like me to answer or any statements? No, I'll just uh, chip in. It's Carol. I don't think there's such a word as imperativity, but that's what I'm trying to say, that um, it's very, very high on my list of things that we need to encourage our champions to have online global collaborative learning. Thanks, Carol. And I love the way you're making up words. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We've got a dictionary as we build this. And this is what we are doing. We are building this as we go. And uh, yes, we're, you know, we're lagging behind makerspaces. We're lagging behind uh, coding. They're the, the real flavours of the month at the moment. But online global collaborative learning is going to have it today. Uh, we, we have the champions around the world. There are many champions and uh, it is imperative, I believe, for the future of learning. We have all of this technology. Uh, Kareen, that's where I hang, higher ed. Well, Kareen, great to have you here. I've actually got a foot in both camps now as well. I've, I've just taken on a new position at Charles Sturt University. Um, just this week actually, um, in the uh, innovation unit there, um, looking at um, one, of my one of my responsibilities is to look at online learning across all of the subjects for Charles State University to try and improve them. So uh, thanks Peggy. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it in my spare time, lol. Um, so there are amazing needs in higher ed even more than K-12, I think. But there are also amazing pockets of excellence there. So, Karina, are you doing anything with global collaboration in higher ed? It'd be great if you could share a link or something or... Um oh, okay, great. Excellent. Julie, I'll just jump in again. It's Carol. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the University of Tasmania and how they are putting on a lot of free courses that involve people from around the world and they can enjoy the collaborative type of learning using the structure that they have within their course um, learning environment. I'm currently studying genealogy with them and they must have thousands of um, participants and uh, it's all free and I think that's going to happen more often. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's, I was just watching a, um, a video, uh, I don't know if it's Diana Laura, Laura Large, actually she's a great, I'm a, a fan of her, she's a UK professor over there in England. Um, she came to Australia and I was watching a video when she spoke at Charles Sturt University talking about how you know, we can scale up the pedagogies that we're working with now, the collaborative pedagogies, we can scale them up to um, apply to large numbers. But it, it's, you have to be aware of what you're doing. Oh, thank you, Corinne. Excellent. I'm not sure if I'm aware of that or not. But I, this is why I love these sessions. I love presenting at them and I love interacting with people because I learn so much. Thanks for that. Okay, please, you know, throw links into the window. Welcome to Ashley, who's just joined us. If she's there still, uh, it's great to get to know you. So, higher ed, uh, you know, this is I've spoken about this. At, I spoke about this at ISTE briefly at the Global Education Afternoon uh, with Lucy Gray and Steve there. Um, in terms of higher ed, think that they're global because they often have campuses now in different countries. And so they have this, and they bring in distance education students who are working in different countries under the one umbrella to do a degree. 
but in fact that's still under the umbrella of one institution. So it's not global in the sense of joining institutions or joining, um, joining courses together or have teachers from two different universities coming together and saying, hey, let's do something together. So it's still not global in that sense. Thinks it through. Great. Okay. Great. Let's keep going here. Got a few more slides and then we're done. So I just want to talk about um, what I've been doing with this uh, Connect with China collaborative, which I've co-developed with my friend Katie Grubb there, who runs Mandarin Pathways here in Australia. And this is we started this in September 2015. We've got a website there, connectchinacollaborative.com. And our idea was to connect uh, people who are inside of China with people who are outside of China. It was just it was really as simple as that. And it actually came from uh, when I did the Google um, Innovative Educators course in September 2014. Uh, this was my moonshot. Uh, I did this with uh, Ewan McIntosh's team. We did moonshot thinking and um, planning, etc. So. So you know, I was already, I had already been flattening classrooms for many years, but I really wanted this to to be a little bit different, to to flatten it even more. So an alternative approach to connected and collaborative learning, etc. Uh, and multi-age. Uh, so we've got different things happening in this in this collaborative. I, I call it a collaborative rather than a global project as such. So we have it's interdisciplinary, it's cross-curricular, it's cross-age. So we've got, uh, we just kicked off again last week, we've got grade 5 right up to grade 12 in the same collaborative and we will do cross-age teams. We're not going to have all the grade 5s and 6s in one team and the high school students in another. No, they will be cross-age uh, teams. Uh, it's thematic, of course it's digitally infused and more importantly with this one in particular it includes the extended community. We have community groups in Australia, we have community groups in China. Uh, speaking to students, connecting with classrooms as part of this learning collaborative. So I really believe this is a, a new model that we're developing which is quite a lot flatter uh, than the typical sort of classroom to classroom type of global collaboration. Uh, so yeah, and this is you know, our focus, the importance of global connections to foster global understanding um, and understanding different perspectives on the world uh, and hearing those different perspectives. Yeah, but by heart it's the same, yeah. And of course it's about innovation um, and all of those words that are on that slide and those quotes there from Yong Zhao and Ken Robinson. And of course the challenge with connecting with China is uh, coming up with the toolkit that you can do this with. And uh, as I said, I lived in China for three years. My friend Katie uh, speaks fluent Mandarin, speaks and writes fluent Mandarin and she lived there for 12 months while she was studying Chinese. Uh, so she's even more connected than I am. My language is uh, what I call taxi language. I can get in and out of a taxi and open the door, that's about it <laughs> in terms of my Chinese speaking ability. But uh, when you're talking virtually, of course, there are many things that are blocked in China, uh, but there are many things that aren't blocked. So wor working through this uh, was an interesting experience. Uh, and of course, WeChat, there's just one tool there, WeChat has been very successful for us. That's, uh, I don't know if you use WhatsApp, it's like a WhatsApp. Uh, chat, uh, tool but everyone in China is using it pretty much and it has video and audio and it's clear and it's, uh, it's accessible and it joins learners together. And then of course we have other tools that are actually working as well. And those uh, international schools are using VPNs, virtual private networks. Uh, the local schools uh, don't use VPNs so that's why we have um, these tools as well. WeChat is great, yes. It really is. Uh, so yeah, so there's some of the tools. Uh, photo bucket. So instead of Flickr, we're using Photo Bucket. Um, voice thread is working okay, etc. So you know, choosing those tools and knowing that people will be able to connect is, is, has been one of the main hurdles. 
So no Google, in other words. <laughs> no Google tools when you want to actually connect with China. So just some slides, just to share some of the learning, just to finish off this presentation. And so this is a, a live session that Anne did with a, a class in Yantai in China. So the students seeing each other, sharing. Uh, that on the right hand side, Emerson was a student in Anne's class. Uh, that's just part of his blog post. There's a, a blog post there from Anne um, that you can read. It's up on the connectchinacollaborative.com website. There's a blog there with uh, different things there as well. So lots of excitement and learning. So it was, it was about the synchronous, it was also about the asynchronous. Uh, some more things. This is actually um, well, here. I'm sitting in Adelaide now. This is uh, Adelaide Emmanuel College. We're involved in the collaborative. They uh, skyped in uh, Green Initiatives, which is a non uh, non government organisation NGO over there in China. So uh, Nitin from Green Initiatives spoke to the Year Seven students, interacted with them. Uh, uh, they also skyped in uh, Harry, who is um, an 18 year old student who was learning Chinese in Beijing. So uh, this was exciting for students, someone more their own age. Uh, so they had a great time talking to Harry when he was in Beijing, Beijing learning about what it was like to go to a university that had 100,000 students and hundreds of cafes, things like that. So just getting that sense of you know place and being and lifestyle and culture, etc. So they're the sort of opportunities that the Connect with China Collaborative are bringing to schools and classrooms. Uh, and then, of course, we, we used VoiceThread for students to actually come together in the mixed classroom teams. Uh, and these are some of you know, just a screenshot of some of the products that do all the digital handshakes to start with, with VoiceThread, hearing the voices. And then, of course, we put together some of our, our themes um, and students responded. It is a great asynchronous tool. Yeah, it is. Um, it's more difficult to connect with China in the US. I know the west coast of USA had more luck, of course, connecting with uh, China synchronously. They did that. Uh, east coast is really difficult. It's pretty impossible actually during school hours. It has to be an after-school uh, activity for one one party at least. So you know the the highlights of uh, connect with China. China connects with our hashtag there. Uh, showed us that it is possible to connect with China. It is possible to have real time and asynchronous uh, learning experiences with uh, with Chinese students. Some of them were in an, in an in, uh, sorry international schools. Some weren't, uh, and that um, you know, learning with China, not just about China, is very possible. So we're forging ahead. Um, with that again this semester. We have now four countries in the collaborative. We've, Canada has joined us uh, and Katie and I are actually going to China in the second half of April. We'll be there for two weeks and we'll be doing live sessions from China and building resources uh, as, we, as we work on that. Yes, and our theme this semester is uh, climate change, which I think is pretty fitting actually uh, given the international conversations that have been going on in the last 12 months, particularly the meetings in Paris. And lots of news about what's happening with China and pollution and trying to uh, fix, fix the pollution situation over there. And I know living in Beijing it was up and down all the time. Thanks Peggy for putting those links in the, in the window there and um, that's great. Great. So let's just some takeaways to finish off. So. Takeaway number one, encourage connected and collaborative learning. Right? So, so look at how you can flatten your learning. What are, what are the connection strategies? What are the citizenship strategies? What are the collaboration strategies? And how can you, particularly if you've got older students and particularly higher education, how can you build in that student autonomy? It's not just the teacher who brings everything to the classroom. Really, a lot of what I talk about now is the student autonomy. How can we encourage students to bring learning experiences to the classroom? You know, it would be quite okay for a student in the China Collaborative to say, hey, I've got connections in China. I want to bring these in so they can be part of our flat learning as well. So that's what, you know, think about that, how that sort of flipping things, uh, different type of flipped learning, <laughs> flipping the learning in a different global way. Uh, so that it's not just the responsibility of the teachers, it's the responsibility of the whole learning community to be connected and collaborative. 
So takeaway number two, take risks and plan for collaboration. All right, uh, if you're in a situation where you're able to forge ahead with this, do so. But what I always say is you know, you're never really completely ready for global collaboration. Just jump in anyway and learn. Learn with others who are perhaps a couple of steps ahead of you and um, uh, you know, take a bit of a risk and be, be uh, upfront about it. You know, talk to your colleagues, talk to your administration, talk to your students and say we're working this out together but it's going to be okay. Oh, absolutely, Peggy. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Yes, I know. Schools who are still telling students they can't use the devices that are actually meant for learning, uh, for communication. Yeah, I know. It's frustrating, I know. Uh, Takeaway three, design for intercultural understanding. So, you know, what can you do in your curriculum? Yeah. Um, yeah, that one, that's where she was taking a leap, I know. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. Uh, we live in a global world, you know, collaboration is for positive change. Uh, so many stories, uh, so many people I've spoken to, and I know that you have as well, about how their perspectives have changed, how their stereotypical attitudes have changed through getting to know people in different cultures. And, you know, monoculturalism is curable. I remember years ago, 20 years ago when I used to work in a school, I used to walk past the language department, uh, in a, this is a school in Melbourne, and they had this big sticker on the wall, um, monolingualism, oh, I can hardly say that, monolingualism, you know, in other words, having one language only is curable. So I think my, my uh, tagline now is monoculturalism is curable. You know, with online global collaboration, you don't have to just think and understand one culture. You should be thinking and understanding numerous cultures. And the last one, takeaway four, make technology the bridge, not the barrier to shifting pedagogy. Okay, we have lots of conversations still to have with our IT people, our tech departments, our tech, the people who buy the technology, the people who control the technology. We need to put the control of the technology in the hands of the students and the teachers. We need to work on our digital citizenship, our global citizenship skills, uh, it's not about talking about uh, citizenship and how to use online learning. It's actually putting people in situations where they experience that. Because how are they going to learn if they, they're not in those situations? And we can't expect to spit them out of high school knowing how to learn online because they, they're coming into universities, and I've seen this, um, and Corinne will know, they're coming into universities and they don't know how to learn online. And so that's just not good enough, really, I don't think that high schools are not doing that job. And that's about it. Corinne says, one of my passions in higher ed is developing global citizenship among students who will not ever study abroad. Yeah, absolutely. Most students will never study abroad, but you can still, at, at, or at any level, K to 12, K to 20, whatever, but yes, totally agree. And that's wonderful you're working in that area, Corinne. Uh, we need to develop these experiences because it's just not possible for us all to travel and do things overseas. Uh, more and more people are, but it's just not physically or economically possible that we can still bring those valuable experiences. So let's be a dragon. Let's all be the dragon that rules and uh, online global collaborative learning is imperative, I believe. Um, Sorry, I had the wrong logo there for some reason. It says 2015. Apologies for that. <laughs> it still says Aussie Life. <laughs> um, have you thought about superimposing the norms diagram over the dragon? Yeah, good idea, Peggy. I'm just thinking about that. Hmm, okay. All right. A uh, little bit about the book. Uh, go to theglobaleducator.net. Sorry, uh, blatant promotion here. It's coming out in April. I've just been talking to... Uh, Hawker at Brownlow, uh, they're going to publish it in Australia and there's a link on that website now to the pre-orders uh, for Hawker Brownlow. So you can actually get it over this side of the world without paying US prices and US postage, okay, just to, to let you know. And they're being really supportive, which is excellent. I can't wait either. It's been a long time coming, hasn't it? <laughs> to the first book. Well, thanks, Corinne. Well, the first book is, uh, is excellent. But 
apologies for so many of the dead links now. Sorry about that. But this new book has got a lot of updated material. Good things are worth waiting for, absolutely. So thank you so much, everybody. It's been a real joy. Um, thank you for your interactions. And uh, don't forget, be the dragon that roars. Thank okay. you so thank much, you. Julie. We were all thoroughly engaged there. And I, for one, will be wanting that book. <laughs> And and it was lovely to have uh, a few new people popping in today. I hope they uh, enjoyed it. You're certainly getting their applause and their thank yous. And I'm going to ask Peggy now to finish off our usual Aussie Live slides. But before I do that, I just want to say that a lot of people in adult learning, school children learning, community learning, need to buy your book. They need to listen to what you have to say. Your wisdom shines through and that's certainly happened today. You have been shining on our world stage. And thank you so much, Julie. Over to you, Peggy. Well, thank you, Carol, for saying that because all I can say now is ditto. I agree with everything you said. This was an outstanding presentation. So many great things to think about. And even if we're believers, there were so many great tips and ways to talk about it. And don't we know that having the language to talk about these things is so important. So thank you very much, Julie for this outstanding keynote. And to all of you, we do want to remind you that you can get a certificate for attending these sessions. So if that's important to you, you can just go to our website, and I'll post that again in the, in the chat, to see where you get the certificate. And I do want to remind you all that you do need to log out for our recording to process. So on a Windows computer, that is file and exit. On a Mac, you go up to Blackboard Collaborate and say quit. Both of them have a red dot or an X that you can click on too. And on mobile, you just say leave session. You select that. So want to let you know that a survey will pop up when you leave our session. And we would love to have you sh share your feedback on the session so that Julie can get that. So thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you, Peggy. And just before we close the recording, uh, maybe there's a couple of thoughts that people have had, and they would like to put them into voice. You're very welcome to come to the microphone before we close the recording. This is where everyone gets very shy. <laughs> but we've had lots of wonderful comments in the text chat. And I wanted to remind folks that if you wanted to save the text chat with all the links that Peggy has put in, the best way to do that is to go to File on the top menu, select Save, and then select Chat. And then you can save it as a text file and look at it again later. Now, Julie will eventually upload her slides, <laughs> and I'm assuming they're going into SlideShare. Is that right, Julie? Oh, Google Slides. Oh, even better. <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, thank you for persevering. I know that connections were a little... Hmm, flaky <laughs> for some people today, but we've managed to get through to the end. And once again, a big round of applause for our keynote, Julie Lindsay.